<clears throat> I'm Paul Reno, and um, I'm not really here as an expert for, with uh, electric vehicles. I have a bit of background. I worked at the Marine Science Center on, on faculty there and for a number of years, retired about 10 years ago. The talk is on electric vehicles, drive us into the future. The real title of the talk is EV Does It. Or, <laughs> So there are numbers of ways to reduce your carbon footprint. This is one that came out in the newspaper a couple of days ago, close to home. Uh, I scrounged up a pile of old solar calculators from garage sales or whatever. I wired them all up and I got free power from my entire house. Wow. <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try it. So there, there are many ways to obviously reduce our carbon footprint, but one of the ways that we can really do that is is to uh, talk about electric vehicle and have a big impact. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about these cars. And uh, this is a quote that I picked up the other day when I was looking up some information. That, and by the time you leave, you should be able to refute the following. I'll read it to you if you can't read in the back. Question, are, hybrid, hybrid, are electric cars a better alternative to hybrids? Answer. Hybrid vehicles are better than electric vehicles. Electric cars are not better than hybrid vehicles because hybrids are better for the environment. Hybrids are less gas than electric cars do. Electric cars have power to be used, so natural gases and fossil fuels are used. Hybrid vehicles do not. Additionally, electric cars use up a lot of carbon and hybrids do not. Hmm? I had to take an aspirin after reading this. <laughs> and it was on a site called debate.org, and there are a number of things on there about this. And I'll show you another one towards the end. This is obviously not true, and I hope that will be able to give you some information that will rectify that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of electric vehicles, the types of electric autos, and how they um, differ. Why would you want to buy an electric vehicle? Why they say you shouldn't buy electric vehicles. And something about some of the EVs that are currently available and find the questions and answers if you want. Okay? So it's really hardly new technology. Everybody thinks of electric vehicles as something that are quite new, but that's not the case. Electrons have been transporting us since 1829. The first electric vehicle was produced by Anders Jedlik from Hungary, who invented the electric motor in 1828, and then a year later he used it to power a small car. So it started back that far. If you think about it, electric motors are everywhere. Think about your house, how many electric motors you have in the various appliances and machines you have in your refrigerator. Set, perhaps your lawnmower, etc., etc. So, electric um, motors are quite vi versatile, efficient to power many different things. So they can be used for a lot of purposes. I've got some examples of different kinds of transportation vehicles that are powered by electricity. Planes. It's pretty hard to believe, but there are a number of planes out there that have been. Uh, is my mouse. <laughs> Use it, the cat uses it more than I do. <laughs> um, so there are planes out there now. This is a, a Cessna with uh, solar panels in its wings to help charge up the batteries. And um, this is the plane that circumnavigated the world a couple of years ago on solar power alone, on electric, on electric engines. You're familiar with trolleys. The first electric trolley was in Germany in 1882. And you're used to seeing things like this around cities that have old tracks that you try to avoid with your tires. Mm -hmm. And in England, the diesel locomotives that you see around are really powered by electricity. The diesel is a generator that generates power that is passed on to the electric motors that actually run the engines. So all of that noise and folderol that you hear around an engine isn't the drive, it's actually the diesels powering 
generating power to, to drive the locomotive. This is one of my favorites. The Shinkansen, which is a bullet train in Japan. Absolutely amazing. It runs on a magnetic track, levitating, and it runs at 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in it, it's just like smooth, perfectly smooth. You're just flashing by everything. It's great, great thing. Um, boats. This is a, a, in, in a lake in Switzerland, electric boats. The first outboard engine was actually electric. And a lot of people have trolling motors, so they're electric also. And this is the planet solar, a solar boat that circumnavigated the globe in 2012. Just within the last month, the Chinese launched a, a vessel that's about two or 300 feet long that um, is tra used for transporting um, coal, of all things, <laughs> but it's run on electric motors, and it's, it's used in river navigation rather than open ocean. It's too small for that. But that's something that, that's coming along. <coughs> Trucks have a, can use the power of electricity. This is a diesel-electric hybrid, very big truck. Yeah for hauling uh, ore and things like that. If, if you notice the name Liebherr, roughly transmitted means, man, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're starting to have trucks that are all electric and using them for delivery vehicles so that they're, they're coming in, into play. Electric buses are out there. Here's one from McAllen, Texas, which is right in big oil companies. So they're starting to pick up on the widespread use of uh, electric transportation vehicles. Even this, the shuttle. The shuttle itself isn't obviously powered by electricity, but the, um, the vessel that takes it to the uh, launch pad is all powered by electricity. Hmm. To give you an idea of the size of these things, that's a human. <laughs> really enormous. Oh, my. Most of us want to drive an actual car. And just a couple of EVs from the past. One of the first ones was the Flocken and Electrowagen back in 1888, which was a pretty neat looking little device. And here's a, an electric taxi in, in Germany in 1904. It seems as though advertising hasn't really changed much in, in the years. This is the Tesla of its time. The ideal electric and the price, $2,000. This mm -hmm. is in 1905 when the average worker's salary was $156 mm -hmm. a year. Pretty pricey. Mm -hmm. and Thomas Edison with an um, electric car that he didn't develop but was he used in 1913. If you look closely, you can see all of the lead acid batteries in the, in the front powering it. An interesting fact. In 1900, 28% of the vehicles in, in the USA were electric vehicles. That was really surprising. And what happened? <laughs> they buried them. Why change horsepower in midstream? Hmm. John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil. Once they discovered oil in the United States, things started to get away from electric vehicles and then they discovered oil in the Middle East, and the money kept rolling in, and electric vehicles became passe. To be fair, the, the autos had a much longer range, which people wanted, and the, and the infrastructure for the electricity and power were inefficient and cumbersome, so they kind of it lay fallow for quite a number of years. But then, in about 1960, this is one of the first modern EVs is the Henny Kilowatt, which was made by the Brunel, and it was uh, sold in France and USA. Notice the neat antenna, Scott? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't really. <laughs> 47 of them sold in two years. Wow. Woo! Big seller. <laughs> Have any of you seen Who Killed the Electric Car? I did, yeah. yeah. That was a very big uh, automobile back in the mid-90s, which they literally crushed when they were done with them. Mm -hmm. Sad story. 
but now we've got more modern ones. This is a um, uh, charging station in Oslo, Norway, and we have a Tesla, something called a Riva One, and a Ford Think all charging in one station. So there are a lot of people who started with electric cars purchasing one of these if they had a lot of money. <laughs> they run about ninety or hundred thousand dollars for those cars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's sort of the, a little bit of the history just to give you an idea of what was around at what time. So today there are three main types of electric vehicles. A hybrid electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and full electric vehicle. So I'd like to go through each one and, and describe to you uh, what they're all about. <clears throat> hybrid electric vehicles have an electric motor, which is it's called a traction motor, it's instead of an engine, and it also has an internal combustion engine, or ICE. Almost all the power is supplied by the internal combustion engine rather than the electric engine on these vehicles. It has a very small battery pack, small amount of uh, power is, is held by electricity, and it has no external connections it's powered, the electrical portion of it is powered and the battery recharged by what's known as regenerative braking. Um, and regenerative braking is a really interesting idea because what it involves is when you press the brake, it turns on a little switch and the wheels are surrounded essentially by a little magnetic motor. And when you press on that brake, it, it, the magnetic motor reverses and sends power from the wheel back to the battery. So you generate electricity by pushing on the brake. And that works really well because, for example, when I'm coming over the bridge, and I have a, a, a leaf, a Nissan leaf from 2012. When I come over the bridge, I gain a mile in, in distance just by putting on the brakes coming down this side of the bridge. So that, that's pretty neat to see. And they work quite effectively. Plug-in hybrids, on the other hand, have the same kind of setup, but their battery is charged through an external source. And that's the one most people think about when they think about an electric vehicle. And the battery has a much larger capacity than the hybrid vehicle and a much greater electric range. There are two types depending on exactly what happens with the, uh, how the engines are constructed. Um, a parallel PHEV has both a traction motor, which is the electric motor, and the regular internal combustion engine, both which can drive the wheels. Okay, so they can do that simultaneously. The other type is called a series PHEV, and it's kind of like the, the uh, engine, the locomotive. It uses gasoline to charge up the en um, motors to power the car, rather than having the gas go directly to the wheels, the generation of the, from the gas motor. How many of you have electric vehicles here? Some sort of one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> wow. So that's pretty good, yeah. <coughs> and lastly, pure electric vehicles, the term BEVs or battery electric vehicles. And there's only an electric motor and there's no gasoline at all associated with it. And there's no dry ice, no internal combustion engine, no gas, no CO2. <coughs> Um, this is what the batteries look like. They're lithium ion batteries, generally speaking. And this is um, a leaf, and they're generally s set underneath, right on the chassis, so that you have a lower <coughs> center of gravity, and that keeps it more stable. They, they're fairly heavy, they're pretty expensive. So the question obviously always arises, why would you want to own an electric vehicle? Well, here's the main reason. It's because of, of the lack of pollu pollution from the tailpipe, CO2. 
zero emissions for a battery electric vehicle and the uh, amount of CO2 that's produced is reduced significantly for both the plug-in and the regular hybrid electric vehicles. So that's really the main concern for, for this audience, I think, as well as for, for people who are purchasing them. They're really low maintenance requirements. They're, they don't take a lot of um, time at the repair shop like uh, regular internal combustion engines. They're very low cost to operate. It's cheaper to utilize electricity for power than it is gasoline. And I, I put this in as this as kind of a, a pet peeve of mine. It's fast, really fast. They are actually quite fast at, at low torque because they accelerate very rapidly because the engine goes on right away and it comes to high power right away. It doesn't have to build up like an internal combustion engine. But even the people who write about electric vehicles always talk about one important thing, how fast it gets from zero to 60 miles an hour. And it always drives me crazy. I can't help it, but oh, this only goes, it takes nine seconds to get 60 miles an hour. I mean, don't buy it because it's a little bit slower than a Corvette. <laughs> In the econ economics of electric vehicles in terms of the pollution CO2, and these, there's going to be a bunch of numbers here, and these are just kind of ballpark numbers, so that's what that's about. Burning gas, a gallon of gas releases 19.6 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. A lot of the gasoline now has 10% ethanol in it, which reduces that pollution level to about 17 pounds. So there are 236 million cars in the United States. They drive an average of 11,000 miles per year. This is interesting, an average mileage is 22 miles per gallon for the cars in the US. That's 500 gallons per car per year, 18 billion gallons of gas a year for passenger autos, releasing about two trillion pounds of CO2 a year. That's a lot. And we can do something about it. In terms of the economics of the vehicle itself, I've got some numbers here from cars that are sort of akin to the Chevrolet Malibu and, and different levels of them, different amounts of uh, power, different ways of powering the, the auto. So the regular Malibu, and this is 2017, gets about 30 miles per gallon. And that would cost you about $8.25 per 100 miles of driving. The Chevrolet Cruze, which again is the same, pretty much the same size, but it's a diesel vehicle, gets 37 miles uh, highway and um, city and it costs 675 per 100 miles. The Chevy Malibu Hybrid, which is this hybrid version of this one, uh, gets 46 miles combined and 550 whoops, per 100 miles. The Chevrolet Volt, which is a um, plug-in hybrid vehicle, has a combined, it gets 42 miles to the gallon but you also have 53 miles from electricity. So that really extends the um, mileage and reduces the cost to about $6 uh, per 100 miles. It's a little more expensive than this because the gas um, efficiency isn't quite as high as that one. And lastly, the Chevrolet Bolt, yeah, <laughs> which is an all electric vehicle, it costs about Two dollars and ten cents per hundred miles. So it's about between a third and a quarter of the amount of money to drive an electric vehicle of some sort. So it, it's a nice saving, you know. I think the new newer volts have um, at speeds less than 25 miles an hour. They always run on electricity. So if you're just around town, 
you're going to get a real benefit from that just because of the uh, use of electricity. And it's the speed. The, the numbers that they show here are based, I think, on, on a car going about 40 miles an hour. So when you're going up and down 101, you're going 55 or, or more. That really cuts it down quite a bit. But you never think about that, and it's one of the, the things that goes on is you don't think about that when you have an internal combustion engine vehicle because you don't notice that difference. You go faster, you, it might be 10 miles or, or less uh, per gallon, but when you're using the electricity, and they always have a little indicator that gives you the instantaneous um, amount of miles you have left so you're not stranded in the middle of nowhere. So you pay attention to that. But you don't pay attention to your speedometer. Your gas level doesn't go down that fast in a regular vehicle. So it, that's a problem. That's really what's going on. Yeah? Yeah, I noticed that these cars are four-cylinder, and that's probably um, not the same as, as the four-cylinder internal combustion engine, I'm guessing. But I once owned a four-cylinder car, and the moment I turned on the heater or air conditioner, I had no power at all. Is the <laughs> same true of an EV? Uh, I'll, I will talk about that, but and accessories and things really can make a difference because they have a, these cars have a 12-volt battery, but the 12-volt battery is charged by the, the main battery, the big battery. So it draws off current from that and puts it into whatever accessories you're using. Okay. So when I'm, in the wintertime, there's a consistently lower range for my car for the, for the uh, LEAF because you're using the windshield wipers and you're using the defogger and you're using the heater and that all draws down on the current and it might cost you 10 or 15 miles in, in, on a full charge. Right. For, for all when you have all of those things on. In the north, in the northeast, for instance, or in, in the Midwest, where it, when it gets really cold, which it is now, people really have a hard time with that because it just sucks all of the power out of it. But there, I'll, I'll show you little indicators later about uh, stations for, for charging, and they have them in like Yellowknife up in the Northwest Territories. So people in an area like that that's that cold, believe in it enough to, to own an electric vehicle, which I find pretty astonishing. So it, it saves you money to um, use an electric vehicle. So why are they more efficient? Why do they get better mileage than an internal combustion engine? An internal combustion engine <clears throat> loses about 60, 70 percent of its energy that's in the gas to thermal losses because you're, you're basically burning it, there's combustion, there's exhaust fuel, all of that heat is dissipating and not going to the wheels. So the power to the wheels is only about 16 to 25 percent. In a hybrid vehicle, uh, not a plug-in plug or a regular hybrid, the engine losses are pretty much the same, and it's a little bit lower, but the power to the wheels are higher because of the regenerative braking. And regenerative braking really contributes, takes a lot of energy, puts it right back in, into the um, batteries. And the full battery electric vehicles, the drive system, the loss for this armature just turning around in the motor, is only 16% rather than 60%. And you have the regenerative braking also. You lose some energy because of the loss during charging when it heats up and the, the batteries heat up and cool down, you lose some energy in that. But you still get 77 to 82% of the energy in the batteries goes to the wheel. So naturally you're gonna get much better efficiency out of this kind of vehicle. Because it's simple. You have thousands of pieces to an engine, lots of parts, and um, it's just much more efficient. So there are fewer parts in a traction engine than an internal combustion engine. You really only have one moving part, which is, the, which is the shaft. And it's 
they don't have transmissions per se. It's just one gear. It's a direct drive. What the engine, the speed of that engine goes right to your wheels in a certain ratio. It's either forward or reverse. That's it. Nothing else there. So you don't lose that, and that's not complicated. It makes it. You don't have to repair the engine. You don't have to repair the transmission. You don't have to repair the exhaust system. There's so many things that these cars don't have that internal combustion engine driven cars do. So there's less routine maintenance. So the lease that I have, I've got about 23,000 miles in it. In, in the manual, 7,500 miles you rotate the tires. 15,000 miles you rotate the tires and change the air cabin filter. 22,500 miles you rotate the tires. 30,000 miles you replace the air cabin filter and rotate the tires. That's it. No oil changes, none of this other jazz. It's all, all done. It's very, very low maintenance. How much do they charge you for that maintenance? Air, air cabin filter replacement? <laughs> well, they charge me $45 for that tire rotation. But that's the only cost that I've had in six years. <laughs> but that's it. Uh, what about uh, cars that are that have the battery, you know, the, uh, the battery, the, the EV, I think you're calling them, how frequently do you have to replace the battery? <clears throat> they have a, an 80,000 uh, 80, mile warranty. Okay. So, they lose about 20 to 30 percent of their original capacity uh, at that by that point, but it's a gradual loss. It's not. It's, it's slowly going down over the over that time frame. So, um, one of the things a lot of people think about is having to replace that battery. But I don't think they've yet really had they. I have a thing where they <coughs> replaced five batteries worldwide in, in the Nissan Leaf so far. So they're not going downhill that fast. And, and it's even at, even at 100,000 miles, you've still got 70 to 80% of the battery capacity there. So your range is just reduced. It's not going to reduce your power, but you're going to be going, able to go 60 miles instead of 85 or something like that. Right, so my question though was uh, more in terms of amortizing the cost of that over a period of years. I don't know if you know this, but how much it costs on an average to replace it. How much does it cost to replace it? It was 10, now it's five. Okay. 5,000 to replace that. And it really makes you think about driving. You have to think about what you're gonna do, where you're gonna go, and you can plan it. And it's, it's certainly doable. People are resistant about doing something like that. They don't, it, the cars in our culture are such a natural extension of ourselves. We don't want to change anything. So it's, it's as much a psychological thing as anything else in terms of getting people to change. So it makes you think about driving. But interestingly, here's some, a couple of graphs. How far do you go in a day? Somebody did a, a, a study with three quarters of a million people. The percentage of trips that were these different miles. So if you look at this green outline, this is one-way trips, 30 miles, which my puny little um, leaf can go 60 miles. So in a day, I would, could make two of these trips. Look how many of the trips are way less than that. About 95% of the trips are less than 30 miles in one way. So most of the time, it's not a problem. When I th was thinking about buying it, I thought, well, you know, on longer trips, it could, I could rent a car. Sticker shop. Oh, these are expensive. Just looking at all the models of Chevrolet and their costs. This is from 2017. So here are the different models of Chevy, and I just picked Chevy because of a lot of models. Yeah. Different kinds of car. We had the hybrid Impala, the Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid electric, and the Bolt, which is a pure electric vehicle. 
these are the ranges of the prices for the various kinds of cars. This is the, the median, the one right in the middle. It's about $50,000. You're not that high in price. The costs aren't that high relative to other cars that are purchased. The average price for a car in 2016 was $33,560. Most of these EVs go for $34,000, $35,000. And it's not so out of line. We've made numbers for all of some of the other com companies. So that's, while it's more expensive than normal car, it's not out of range for what people actually buy. <clears throat> Incomplete infrastructure. Get a charge out of this. Because the primary mode of charging up your vehicle when you have an EV is at home. Right? 80%. 80%. Is what the national average is 80% uh -huh. of electric car charging is at home. Right. And so most of the time, you're not worried about the external charging, it's what you have at home. Um, and you can just plug it in at 120. Just a regular plug-in, you know, any In terms of the amount of electricity we use, it's more determined by the season, so I haven't really seen any change. Plug and I have, I have the, the, the Leaf, which I run on a 240, um, and the uh, Prius just runs on 110. And it just plugs it in, it takes about four, four and a half hours for it to, to fill up um, the Leaf on, 240 takes about that same length of time. But it's the situation here is really good because of the cost of electricity is quite low. And um, so it hasn't made it any impact really on my, my electric bill. So. so you can charge at three different levels. You can charge at 120 volts, which is called level one, and you get about five miles of charge per hour on that. The 240, which I use at home it is level two, and that gives you about 15 miles. And there's a high-speed charger like the one down in the center of town across from the uh, Mexican restaurant mm -hmm. in the parking lot mm -hmm. is um, a level three in which you get 60 miles per hour in the charge. Um, so the, the charge is is based, how fast your actual car charges up is based on, on the wattage capacity of the onboard charger. Remember the charger is on the car, it's, it's not in the plug, that, the power that's coming to you. So they range, mine is a, a very early model of the Leaf, so it only has a 3.3 uh, kilowatt charger. All of the, the infrastructure isn't quite set up yet. They, they haven't had the fights to agree which, which standard to use. Like a wall outlet is now the same everywhere in the United States, but they haven't done that yet. But the most common kind of plug on the end that's right over there is, is called the J1772, and it, and it looks like this. It's got five um, contacts. The Bolt and others have what's called a CCS combo. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. I haven't actually seen one, but. So it has the same kind of configuration, but it also has an adapter for another another kind of plug that you can can use. Um, the Tesla has its own supercharger, which is considerably faster than any of the others. Um, and the L3, the level three is Chademo. I don't know how to pronounce that. I've never heard it pronounced. It's a Japanese acronym. Oh, it is? And, and uh, I can't even you know, say the whole line, but basically it's an abbreviation for let's have tea when we're charging. <laughs> you can buy charging units for at home that are pretty much the same as these, and they, they're pretty expensive. What's interesting is that one of the big expenses is differences in price is how long the cord is. Mm -hmm. It runs maybe about ten dollars a foot for the for the cord. Mm -hmm. So, if you get a fifteen foot cord, it's considerably cheaper than twenty five foot cord. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of look at where your outlet is and where the vehicle is going to be when you when you buy that 
and think about how big your wallet is too. Mm -hmm. But there, you can just buy them, and some of them like this, the um, Aero environment. This is a, just a plug. It's a little plug you plug into the wall. Some of them are um, hardwired right into uh, into the 240 line, and others are portable where they plug into an adapter. And then they use uh, people who have apartments can use those. They can take them with them so they don't have to leave that there. Did you have to have an electrician component and uh, reconfigure your garage for the 240? No, I had a saw, a 240 volt saw, so I had a line down there already. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so charging externally, you have, the U.S. has 17,500 stations. Aero Environment, the company that makes, um, actually was involved in making the um, the GM EV1 has installed units every 25 miles between Mexico and Canada along I-5. Oh. And also along much of 101, every 25 miles. There are three units in Newport, five in Lincoln City, even one in Seal Rock. Do you use a station? How do they charge you? The aero environment stations were free for the first, maybe, Couple of years anyway. Couple or three years. Because they had a contract with the government to do all of this. They, they got a grant from the government to do all of this. Um, but now they charge, um, you can get unlimited usage for $20 a month. Or every time you can use the high, um, high speed charger, it costs $750. And if you use the, the level two, it's Two fifty, and and other companies. There's another company called Blink, which charges you by how many watts you use rather than just a flat fee. So there's all, there's still a lot of variability here in figuring out how they're going to be doing this. But most of these places are most of these stations are at places like Freddy's, Walgreens, Walmart. So in Corvallis, you can go to the Freddy's and Wal in Corvallis. And plug it in right there, so when you're shopping, you can, your your car is charging up, which is really kind of a, a neat way to do it. You want to use them? Yeah. Is there a way to tell whether a particular charger is in use? Yes. The phone. Use the app. They have an app for the phones. Last one, vested interests. This is the most problematic. I hope this works. You have to listen. to What we got here is a failure to communicate. What we got here is a failure to communicate. And that's really the case here, Luke, because there are those that are going to be affected by electric vehicles really fighting this tooth and nail. And you're, you're really talking about oil and the automobile manufacturers and, and sales to Eugene, and they have one person who knows about the electric cars and <laughs> I've discovered that that's kind of the way they set it up so they'll have one person who's knowledgeable and other people who are don't want to deal with it at all so you if you're interested in this that that you might encounter that problem um, but it was this this man was very good very knowledgeable about about the leaf sold me I think I drove it off a lot the next day it was I'm so happy. <laughs> People who buy these electric vehicles are so happy about them. It's just amazing. I see other people smiling. And, and it really is fun. But, so they don't, they don't get much of a profit margin. They don't want to sell them. And the other thing that's really important, I think, to them is the repair costs. If you think about how much money a car dealer makes from repairing an automobile, it's considerably higher for an ICE than it is for vehicle. They don't want to lose that much business. So they're very reticent. Hmm. Obviously the petroleum companies. They don't even want the uh, miles per gallon to increase because they're losing business. And they really fight. There's something called CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy. It's a, it's a regulation that says that 
each company has to achieve a certain level of mileage per gallon for the whole fleet of cars that they produce. While they're putting out pickup trucks and they're putting out as big SUVs mm -hmm. and they're not going to make that level. So they have to compensate for that and the way they do that is by making the um, electric vehicles. And they're called, they call them compliance cars <laughs> and they make just enough of those to make that cafe standard. Mm. And so they, they don't want to do this. They don't want to sell these cars because they don't make money on them. And, and they're going to have to do, you know, resist as much as they can. And they do. They're very good at this. They made them roll back the cafe standards for the cars. So and there you know how much power the people can have. So. There's some of the drivel. You're, you're better off buying a hybrid electric vehicle than a, than a battery electric vehicle in states that use coal to generate electricity. <laughs> well, those are the states that use that are West Virginia, Texas, and Wyoming are the three big states for um, using coal. And that, that's true to an extent, but the answer is not don't buy these automobiles. It's don't use coal. I mean, <laughs> so they're, they're really switching things around. It's a bait and switch kind of thing, trying to convince people not to buy the automobiles that they should be buying to really help, help the environment. Another one that I like is this one. If too many people buy EVs, you won't have enough power to charge them all. Do you think that will happen? We're going to fall off this cliff. We take a look at our grid and Central Lincoln has enough capacity from Bonneville power that will be just fine. Yeah, I, I'm not worried. Plug away, please. <laughs> It's like, well, the lights are going to start flickering. <laughs> so here, here's a distribution of the source of, of energy, of power generation, 39. And these are just numbers I got from somewhere. I don't know if you know more about it than I do. But about 39% is coal, 27% uh, natural gas, about 20% nuclear, 13% renewables. So that's quite a lot of, of coal and, um, and gas, and the reason that's problematic is CO2 production that occurs. If you look at coal produces 1,000 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, uh, natural gas 469. If you look at the more renewable res resources, 4, 12, and 16, not anywhere near the levels that coal or gas produce. So there's a real big differential if you're using hydroelectric and wind and nuclear uh, to generate the electricity. Mm. Wait, can <laughs> PUD. We serve parts of four counties, so small, we correction it's, it's the, we actually serve all the way from Lincoln Beach to North Bend. Okay. So we're not Lincoln County PUD. Sorry. So it's 84% large hydro, 11% nuclear, small hydro, 1% wind, 1%, 3% unspecified. Great, you don't have to worry about that if you've got an electric vehicle here. And this is a really good place to be if you want an electric vehicle. The electricity is clean, the power is clean, the, the weather is really pretty good for an electric vehicle. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. It's a good place. Um, but here's one, 190,000 plug-ins and, and um, battery vehicles were sold in the United States. A lot, of, about 20,000 more or less volts, volts and Prius primes. So that's a pretty good number. And it's, it's going up. There's a, you are what you eat, you are what you buy. <laughs>